and the other is what I call the education plan. So the, the, the market-based business plan was basically uh, the, the approach that the BC Liberals took uh, to encouraging uh, the, essentially this, this uh, privatization you know, by stealth, really. Uh, in, and it's based on making income over costs, as opposed to what I would call the educational plan is providing services based on student needs, not on, uh, on, on fees. Uh, the market-based plan looks to seek students from outside the district who bring income, as opposed to be, being aimed primarily at serving the students in the community uh, of the, the district. Uh, the market-based one is competitive, uh, and you'll see in the examples I give of what, how that, what that competition looks like, whereas an education plan should be cooperative. Uh, the market-based plan list creates resources to sell as opposed to creating them free for all or under, under a Creative Commons approach. And the uh, market-based uh, plan obviously uh, offers incentives as, way, as a way of attracting the students outside the district who bring income in, as opposed to focusing on the supports that are there for, for students. We were in a position from the time the BC Liberals came in into power uh, where they introduced austerity. For, there was never enough money to, to cover the, the costs of education. And school districts had two ways of increasing the funding over what the province provided. They, they projected a third one as well, which was business companies, but those essentially failed to, uh, to produce and, and most of them simply were uh, eliminated by boards. The two that were uh, adopted were international students and distributed learning. International students would bring uh, the, the money into, into the district from uh, high tuitions, twice what uh, the, the per capita was that the province would give in grants for Canadian students. And the distributed learning approach, uh, also I'll talk a little bit more later about it how it developed. And the, the, the government encouraged both of these. So what do we see has happened? Well, the tre tremendous increase in offshore tuition for international students uh, was at 55 million at the beginning of the century. And this last year uh, was at 242 million. So a substantial chunk of, uh, uh, of revenue. Noted uh, uh, one area of the uh, reduction in the, the total amount that was taken in. Uh, in it's 2008-2009 and in 2009-2010. Uh, and th those, of course, coincide with the, the, the global uh, recession that started at that time and also indicates uh, 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 the potential problems with depending on revenue from sources like that because it's subject to uh, a whole variety of potential uh, problems, uh, such as uh, if there were an international uh, SARS type uh, uh, illness, uh, you know, that, that reduced the, the number of, of people who wanted to to uh, and fo uh, folks as well. Two million too is probably only about half the amount of money that these international students bring into the province because uh, there are uh, homestay fees and uh, various things that students will do while they're there. And so the, it's probably close to $500 million uh, last year that, that uh, uh, came in into the province. And one of the, the results has been a, a very significant inequality. If you look at the, the these are all of the school districts listed by the, the percentage of the school district revenue 
uh, that came in from uh, from this this tuition, uh, and it shows a as you can see a very dramatic difference in terms of uh, uh, the you know who who is getting resources and who isn't. There are all these districts over on the right that have either zero or close to zero uh, revenue from this, and at the far left, uh, the the highest one what is West Vancouver. You know, and it's a very good indicator of the the inequality that that it it's the uh, the district with the highest socioeconomic status that also has the greatest supplement. And I think that's the way you look at this: is these are supplements to the the education program that's paid by the province. You know, so it it's a uh, uh, an, an important indicator of, of inequality when some districts have a lot of extra money uh, to, to spend on, on their students and, and others have none. Uh, you, know, you can see here in this chart, uh, just taking the, the, all the districts that, that took in 5% or more of their uh, total revenue is, was uh, from international students. You'll notice as you look down at that, well, the, the district with the most dollars is, is Coquitlam, uh, and it's second to Vancouver, West Vancouver in terms of the, uh, the percentage supplement to the, you know, which is an indicator of the, the aggressive uh, international marketing that Coquitlam has done. The current superintendent was the uh, assistant superintendent in charge of international students before she became superintendent. Uh, they've made significant uh, commitments with the, uh, the Confucius Institute, uh, a, a Chinese uh, soft power uh, uh, project. Um, and of course, West Vancouver doesn't have as much money because it's a much smaller district than, than uh, Coquitlam, but has a higher percentage of its budget that's a supplement. Another thing you'll notice in, in this is where these, these districts are, you know, uh, and primarily they are in uh, the metro area or on Vancouver Island, uh, with a couple of exceptions. One is Rocky Mountain, which evidently can, can attract uh, uh, people who want to come to ski, uh, and Vernon is in, in, in the Okanagan. Those are the, really the, the only two exceptions. And one of the districts, the metro district that's missing from here is uh, Surrey. It has a fairly substantial number of dollars that come in, uh, but uh, it's such a large district that represents only a small uh, uh, portion of uh, additional revenue uh, for, given that the, how large the budget is. And, and it makes sense too that this is a district that's having trouble finding places for uh, students. The, you know, it's got hundreds of portables, et cetera. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't make sense for it to be out recruiting uh, for more students because they simply can't handle the, uh, you know, what they have now. So I wanted to take, go back to the business plan and, and education plan for equity and think about it in terms of international students. But there are a couple of ways that we can, can look at them. They, there are two rationales for having international students. One of them is the straight you know, a, a business, the source of revenue. But the other is that an argument that's sometimes made that uh, it's a rich experience for Canadian students to have international students you know, in, in their district. It, it uh, increases the diversity and uh, you know, so you know, that should be considered as a, a factor. Uh, the, under the business plan, all the money that comes in is positive for the, that, their own district, but not for uh, the, the impact it has on, uh, on inequity. At one stage, five or six years ago, the province actually uh, proposed that there be some sharing of revenue, uh, but that was uh, quickly uh, put down by the, the districts and the superintendents. Uh, who who simply weren't prepared to give up the revenue. Uh, an, another factor in terms of the business plan is that only rich students from other countries are able to be here. 
uh, costs at least $30,000 a year by the time you count in about $15,000 in, in tuition, uh, the homestay costs, uh, the, you know, the, the various kinds of things that students spend money on there, and, uh, and just the, the airfare for the students to, to come to, to, uh, uh, to Canada. So, you know, it's a, a, a distorting and in, an unequal situation, not just in terms of who gets access in British Columbia uh, to the additional revenue, but it also is, is a, uh, increasing the, the inequities that exist on a, on a global basis as well. So if you want to, if you see the, the uh, value of international students as a rich experience for our own students, uh, then there are a couple of things that you would do that, that uh, uh, challenge the, the, or at least reduce the inequities. One would be to place international students around the province. Uh, the, the province would need to take responsibility for this rather than just leaving it up to school districts because they, it simply isn't feasible for uh, the, you know, a district like Quenelle to send recruiters to the, fair, the, the student fairs that, uh, that are held in China and Brazil and in a variety of other countries that are the main sources of our, uh, of our students. So the, the province would have to take, you know, a, a, a role in this and design a program that made it feasible uh, to, both to give the a, a positive experience to international students and to uh, to provide a service that that is is there for all of our students, not just those in in the the uh, high uh, income areas. And you would use some revenue to support students without the ability to pay to produce more diversity. Uh, there, for example, are, are virtually no, in fact, I don't think there are any students from from Africa. Uh, who are a part of the the uh, international you know students? There are a variety of countries that we have no students from, and of course countries where we do have students from who are only the children of the uh, of elites that can afford thirty thousand dollars a year for their children's you know high school education. So that's a you know a, a way to think about the the equity uh, questions in terms of international students. <clears throat> 